Ahora estoy en el canal en inglés. Creo que no habría ningún problema. Así que estaríamos listos. Gracias.
Hello everyone, my name is Carolina Rubia, Executive Director of Fundación Descubreme, and I welcome you to the second day of the Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Spanish-speaking world, employment and ICTs. 
Yesterday was a wonderful day in which we were able to learn about excellent experiences of inclusive employment, how they favor partnerships in this process of integration and innovative cutting edge technologies for people with disabilities. For those who cannot see me, I'm a woman with a fair complexion wearing a blue um, jacket, a blue trousers and a scarf with flowers. I would like to begin by greeting my hosting partner, Carolina Garcia, who will be joining us once again in this day. Good morning, Carolina. Welcome and thank you very much for being here. Good morning, Carolina, and thank you for the invitation. For those who cannot see me, I'm a fair skinned woman dressing a black blouse and an animal print trousers. And I'm a person with a disability, so I'm sitting on a wheelchair. We would like to start today by thanking all those who are with us today and who have connected from different parts of the world to listen, learn, and share the different initiatives that are being implemented around the world with the aim of improving opportunities for access to employment and ICTs for people with disabilities. We thank Scotiabank, our main sponsor, and the support from Nestle, SMU, and the Colombian company, AT Medios, who are supporting closed captioning in real time. We also thank our patrons who are joining us today in different initiatives. The Government of Chile, the Service for Disability, the Labor Department from the government of Chile, the Ministry of Social Development and Family of the Ministry of Chile, the Austria Embassy, and, M and Microsoft for the Americas. Now it's time to start with our keynote speeches. Our first topic is inclusion as an element of success, international companies. We will learn about the Interna internationalization of corporate strategies around disability. We will have presentations with, uh, from Susan Scott Parker, founder of Business Disability International, and then with Laurie Henborn, Managing Director of, of Research at, at uh, Accenture. I have the special mission of introducing our first speaker, Susan Scott Parker, founder of Business Disability International, uh, which is based, uh, based in England. Susan is a strategic uh, advisor consultant of the international to the International Labor Organization's Global Disability Business Network and has long-standing strategic uh, partnerships with organizations and initiatives such as the Australian Disability Network, the Austrian-German Disability Business Network, My Ability, the Valuable 500, the movement uh, hashtag purple light up and zero project we're truly really honored to have you present at this conference and very grateful that you can share your experience at our um, conference thank you very much carolina carolina it's a pleasure for me to be with you in this important event on global businesses management positions and disabilities all this is changing um, because of economic reasons and ethic reasons. So the central idea is to adapt to human nature. As you see, different businesses and networks are growing and multinationals are joining to this exchange, including international networks, including America, Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, and Chile. Many places are working in within the region with the valuable 500. And we had 500 companies that committed themselves to put disability in the center to improve the management of disability in these global organizations. These are included, including Google, Aston Martin, Shell, BBC, among others. And it's something very useful whenever, because we are convinced that organizations need to invest in improving the development and performance and disability, knowing that these companies are 
clearly not waking up today and decided to become entities of with quality, but they understand the benefits in the commercial area and, and understand that they need to recruit people based on their abilities. That's the best way to face their customers, clients, productivity, and to have better offers for the product products more innovative and everything is Im impulsated for for improving everything with uh, including the disability we have 1.3 billion of people with disabilities around the world and their families are also changing 136 countries have ratified the convention of the un on disability so we are really worried about inequity and how it's growing. So for instance, we have global movement movements in pools uh, done by thousands of employees that have disabilities and they are contributing economically in the workplace. Leaders, business leaders need to be intelligent, need to be updated, welcoming people with disability because it's too important to leave it aside or leave it to the political atmosphere. Global businesses need to do this. A 20% of the population of any country will have some sort of disability and the po population keeps on growing. So we see that the business opportunities in the communities need to improve this and will improve as workers and businesses are more responsible in allies for the disability area. For instance, we have Microsoft, Cisco, HP, Salesforce, et cetera, are investing in digital training that will allow people with disabilities to have the skills that are needed by workers um, for, for companies all over the world. This is important because we, we need to have this contribution in the new world. 1.3 billion people have disabilities of some sort. So we have people from 50 to 64 years old that have some disabilities. It's a really important base. And 80% of disabilities are visible in people over 30 years of age. Most of them um, have experimented disability for less than 10 years. And at least one of through three employees have may have disabilities. And everyone knows someone with disabilities. So remember that one of the of five women in the world have some sort of disability. So our gender is gender an issue. Remember to remove barriers, we need to recruit and employ people with disabilities as well. This is a vicious cycle. And if we can move to the next slide for instance 160 million of clients in brazil have the people responsible in this slide because we need to be free from barrier barriers with for people with disabilities in the commercial sense million of clients will have the, the ease to purchase for instance on internet or if uh, stores are more accessible if we can understand the impact of uh, visually disabled people, for instance, you have new labels or for the deaf community, whenever they need to purchase something that also has to be implemented. implemented. This is uh, relevant data for business so they can get easy to the colleagues. So please, if we can move to the next slide. I cannot talk about clients or customers with disabilities because when I think on retail in the UK, whenever we try to train people to welcome to the deaf community, they realized that they were receiving candidates from people from the deaf community because they, they learned about it that they were valued as clients, clients and customers. So they would, they would value collaborators. 
therefore this is really important statistics suggest that any great organization in the uk or any place will have 10 to 11 percent of their workforce existing with some sort of disability and from 10 to 12 percent of any organization of a big size will have people with disability working women 80 percent of disabilities are not visible immediately and many people with disability do not describe themselves as people with disability especially before um, their employers because of the adjustments that need to be done on the companies and and that could help and improve accessibility it could uh, reduce uh, work non-attendance and uh, to improve the tools for workers for instance would be a great contribution for the business so we need to learn the in-house learning to know what to do within the company for instance we have more than 5.5 million people only in brazil they have the impact of migraines for instance and how they can do their work better and migraines do not count as a disability for instance that could be managed one of my favorite stories is a bank in the uk that decided that managers should be in, uh, ask others what can we do can we do to make your work easier and the colleagues without disabilities started asking why those people are the only one with uh, help and that question was made in every management area and they said how can we ease your work in any way first you need to prove that you have a disability and then it would be a legal obligation to make the environment environment better for those people for of course the law is not stating that in that way but it's determined that uh, you need to improve the way your workers work it's a really powerful message and you need to understand that they need to make adjustments so everyone can it everyone can request an adjustment flexible time any sums or of assistance device parking places special keyboards on uh, interview based on skills so it would be easier for all those who need some sort of adjustment in a, a service is being created which is coordinated to monitor the quality on the service and it the objective is that each colleague any person could have access to tools and the flexibility that they need the waiting time has diminished from months to 20 days and that's based on confidence and that they don't need to wait for someone to confirm that that it's needed it's a legal obligation now so they need to make the adjustments they analyze the cost benefit and that's done let's move on to the next slide and my point being is that confidence is a really important thing whenever you are working with people that need to make some adjustments so they can do their work the best way, way possible ibm works with us to minimize the risk that is triggering um the recruiting processes that can have issues with the workforce so in ibm they know that if a person is doing a recruiting process it'll be easier for them to recruit the right person based on their skills and once a conversation i once had a very really uh, important conversation in the uk and i talked about uh, a bank in london that have 900 desks and workstations for right-handed people not taking into account that 10 percent of them were left-handed um, people and they didn't know that they have a mouse that was different for the people that needed different uh, mouses 
And um, do they need some medical certificate? No, it's like, like a legal obligation to make those adjustments because the wrong mouse would harm the wrist of the person working with it. Even that can be changed. So they had to pay for mouses, uh, mice uh, for um, left-handed people. So that would be good for the people, good for business, it shouldn't be questioned. So that's the reality. 10% of the people in the world is left-handed, 10% of people in the world has dyslexia. And that's my point. If we learn to do things easier for everyone so everyone can work better, all the processes of management for disability are better, it'll be more direct. And a classic example for this would be, for instance, for instance, these lights are giving me a migraine. I'm going to have a time out because of the pain. And in, in, in fact, that's a consequence of disability. If you remember before, 5.5 million of people in Brazil have migraines. Shouldn't you change the bulbs, the lights? because they are stopping their work just because they have a migraine and it, that hasn't been recognized as a disability. But that's not the real question for the senior team. How many, how much time are you going to change? Uh, how much time are you going to wait to change the lights? Who's paying for that change? Who's paying the person going up the, the, the ladder and changing the lights? That has to be verified. If a company trusts and and understand that needs to be done and when it has to be done they will concentrate and focus on productivity so would this change make everything easier that's what they need to analyze so we need to treat others fairly not because it's some it's an obligation because of the law we need to focus and treating everyone in the same way. But we need to learn about the opportunities and try people in a just way so they can reach their full potential. I will never forget someone that was using a wheelchair and said, why do you need a commercial case to treat me right? Good news, because treating you correctly is a good business case. Thank you. Thank you very much again for sharing your experience, Susan. We want to talk to you and get your point of view on some specific issues. For starters, um, it's easier to say there are compelling business and ethical arguments about best practices, but business people don't really believe it. How can we get their attention and persuade them that they need to change? As I was trying to say, since not everyone may believe in the business cases, many do believe. So while we try to capture the intention of the businessman to focus the reality of the business talking on other companies, what they are doing, and if we're having the benefits for them and for society and the communication between companies is important, it's crucial for leaders, commercial leaders, to gather with people with disabilities, with different experiences of life, to talk on their life, life realities and allow them to learn from one another, clients with disabilities and all managers who are hiring the potential workers. And in that way, we have to continue building opportunities between commercial leaders and people with disabilities. We have to let them meet, do not have barriers, and start talking about Jorge, Susana, and all the individuals instead of talking about them like the 1300 people with disabilities because we have to give a contribution to all of them including 
Jorge en Susana. Gracias, Susan, por tan interesante punto de vista. Thank you, Susan, for such an interesting point of view. To follow up, in your opinion, what are, what are the biggest mistakes disability rights advocates and activists make when trying to inspire companies to adopt this new approach to disability? What are the traditional, you should hire people with disability messages that have the most and least impact? When you're asking about the biggest mistakes that I see that uh, defenders see or advocates see is that they have fundamental things at, at risk. One of the message that employers receive is that they are the problem and advocates generalize about millions of people that work in the private sector, for instance. And the ironic thing is that employers are so do not generalize people with disabilities but the sector with disabilities is also generalized people that works in the private sector it's a, an obstacle for this work to be able to communicate and build new relationships in these uh, complex topics so what's the obstacle what are the barriers generalizations in general they should hire people with disabilities 13 um 100 millions, they're always smiling, they're always available. This is a generalized message, but what we do not know is that these 1300 millions, we don't know about all the Canadians, we don't know that we need to hire Canadians because they are Canadians, or not because some can do the work and others don't. Some need adjustments, others uh, don't. We should be talking about what is needed to be done to be hired. Everyone in, based on skills. We, do, we should not assume anything. For instance, I'm Canadian, but that doesn't define me to be able to achieve a, a job position. We have to start generalizing people, the private sector, people with disabilities, and we need to think on how to overcome barriers for clients and customers and to build a new focus to make it easier for everyone and say, yes, I would like to receive a little bit of help and support to perform my work. Susan, if you had one piece of advice on how to change these assumptions, behaviors, and organizational cultures of companies, what would be? If I only had to give you one example to change these assumptions from workers is to encourage them to talk straightforward with people with disabilities. Remember that they are already hiring people with disability on their organizations. So it's mo most likely that they don't have a, a, an open communication. They need, need to listen to their own personnel. The head of the global bank said that everyone in the business from managers, anyone has a skill and anyone should tell us how what they need or what we can do to improve their work performance and we need to take to drink a coffee together we need to listen for instance how hard is to adapt technology so everyone can work at their best for instance there is a department or a transference a technological transfer program mentorship training for people with disability whenever you see their job applications, careers. For instance, whenever you mention a mentor at work to overcome obstacles and to certainly capture an interest so they can do something in a strategy from person to person, face to face, I cannot stress enough the important this 
movement, important movement for the people with disability and the workforce around the world. It's a celebration, but we need to focus on the work of people with disabilities and what they're giving to this organization. I can keep on talking on this, but the important thing is that we need to talk to the clients and customers of, of disability. They're losing opportunities of the people who wants to invest money, money on you. Thank you very much for your very interesting point of view, Susan. To finish, we'd like to ask you, what advice would you give to the well-meaning business leader who wants to persuade senior ex executives and their peers that they should think and behave differently when it comes to people with disabilities? In terms of the advices that I can give to senior leaders, is to listen and learn directly from their personnel and the people with disabilities and also to listen to the counterparts in leaders leader companies around the world there's public intentions that are well known saying that they can improve there is a crisis inequity in disability is important we are losing commercial opportunities you need to look for organizations that are a part of the campaign Or the most valuable 500. There are organizations all over the world that participate in the network of the people with disability. There are multinationals that are looking for best practices to align them with their work. It's not that simple. Six months could take in any part of the world. The point is that we need to give people the tools and fulfill and meet the legislation that sometimes is quite inefficient, but we need to analyze first where they are, where the commercial leaders are going to take what they can learn from there, their experience, the practical way in which they are addressing this issue. As I said before, you need to start listening to your clients and customers, your personnel, your potential talent to make sure that everything is aligned with the world that is changing around you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for being part of our 2021 Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Spanish-speaking world. We wish you all the success and an excellent day. To continue with our next uh, segment, we will introduce our next guest. It falls to me to introduce Lori Henborn, Managing Director of Research at Accenture, who joined us from New York. Lori leads global research and thought leadership development at Accent Research. She's a board member of the American Association of People with Disabilities and a member of Accenture's Global Disability Inclusion Advisory Council. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Thank you so much. So if we're ready to begin, um, first, thank you so much, Carla and Catalina, and to the Zero Project team for hosting this important event. It is lovely to be here with all of you today. And hello from New York. Um, again, my name is Lori Henneborn, thrilled to be connecting with you today and discuss what I hope will be a thought and action provoking topic. I am a white woman with dark blonde hair, hazel eyes, wearing a ivory colored shirt with a gray sweater. I have my home office background here uh, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. So as mentioned, I am a managing director at Accenture. We're a leading global professional services firm with nearly 600,000 employees around the globe. I lead research and thought leadership development focused on raising awareness and taking actions pertaining to disability inclusion and equality in the workplace. And to that end, I led the research for the studies that you'll hear about in this session 
uh, and also for the Getting to Equal Disability Inclusion Advantage study. Uh, and this was released in 2018. Uh, for all intensive purposes, it was uh, the first quantitative business case for why organizations need to be recruiting, hiring, advancing persons with disabilities. I am on the board of directors for APD and I sit on the Disability Inclusion Advisory Council here at Accenture. And finally, I am especially passionate about coaching and mentoring colleagues with invisible disabilities, drawing from my own experience since being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2004. So if we could please pull up the slides, we can get started. And let's go to the next slide, please. Excellent. So Accenture have been on this journey with our inclusion and diversity research program, which traditionally has been focused on, um, it, 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 well, the getting to equal research program, right, was traditionally focused on the critical gender equality issue. But in 2019 and 2020, we had this opportunity to incorporate several what I call dimensions of diversity. And this was possible due to a truly multifaceted survey of 30,000 employees and uh, 1,750 executives from almost 30 countries conducted in 2019. And from this core survey, we've been able to release the core report in 2020, and then with results from 6,000 employees and nearly 700 executives with disabilities, we have the global study focused on the role of culture for disability inclusion titled Enabling Change, which we then launched in time for last year's International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And ultimately, all of this powerful content aims to confirm our passion and position on inclusion and diversity in its broadest sense, while delivering that understanding of tangible actions that our clients can take to advance along their own journeys. Now, for the purpose of this discussion today, I'm going to focus on our sample across Brazil, Argentina, and Spain, which equates to a little over 3,000 employees and 180 executives, including nearly 670 employees and 42 executives identifying as having a disability. And you'll see in some slides, I, I kind of could use an acronym for these three countries, BAS, just in case you were curious about that. So let's go to the next slide. And first, you know, it's important um, to, to ground the discussion, right, and the research in the scale of disability and how employment is trending around the world. That this is not a niche issue. Persons with disabilities represent about 15%, that's roughly 1 billion of the world's population. And it's important not to forget, 80% of disabilities emerge when people are of working age, like me means that any of us could acquire a disability at any time. This is not a matter of them, but a matter of all of us. So again, not a niche issue. And I know Susan has done an amazing job setting the context on participation in the workforce, which is disproportionately low. It's estimated across the world, close to 80% of persons with disabilities are not employed. In most developed countries, the official, the official unemployment rate for persons with disabilities of working age is at least twice that of those who have no disability. In Latin America, the employment rate hovers between 10 and 20%, depending on the country. Next slide, please. So persons with disabilities are less likely to be in paid employment than their peers. But what of those of us who, who do make it into employment? Well, the harsh reality is that we're less likely to thrive than our peers when we get there. When we found from, uh, or what we found from our combined results for Brazil, Argentina, and Spain, is that employees with disabilities are 8% less likely to feel included in the workplace compared with the average. And by included, we mean they feel 
like a key component of their team with real influence over decisions. And they're 42% more likely to feel excluded. And by excluded, we mean ignored or with no voice in the team. So the bottom line here, employees with disabilities less likely to feel included, more likely to feel excluded. Next slide. And now you may be wondering why. Why do employees with disabilities feel excluded or undervalued? Well, one issue we uncovered was there's this lack of transparency and trust in workplaces. The sense that employees don't feel safe about opening up about the disabilities that they have. From employee interviews that we conducted around the globe, we found that there are fears around things like retaliation, slower progression, less meaningful roles. And this survey unearthed some of the challenges or barriers that surface as well. For example, 83% of employees with disabilities in our countries of Brazil, Argentina, and Spain say it's important for them to have the freedom to be the same person at work as they are at home. But just 23% are fully open with colleagues about their disability. So you see there's a clash there. If you want to be the same person at work, then surely you should be able to bring your whole self to work and tell others about who you are as a, an individual, even about your disability. And 80% say that having senior role models are important for them to thrive. But only 29% of executives are fully transparent about their disability. So while executives are a bit more open about their disabilities, they're still denying employees these role models to allow them to thrive and feel confident in the workplace. Um, let's, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, and that point about feeling safe is brought out strongly by the chart here. In fact, across a range of indicators, we see leaders overestimating how safe employees feel raising sensitive issues. For example, 87% of executives believe their employees feel safe about being open about a physical disability. And this drops to just 64% of employees with disabilities agreeing. And you see a very similar pattern emerging for other areas about having mental health challenges, being open about neurological conditions. There's a big perception reality gap here, right? Which, which leads to this lack of urgency that I mentioned earlier. Why should executives change if they believe that organizations are doing a good job for their employees with disabilities? Next slide. So let's pivot now to the important topic of accessibility and accommodations because through the same survey, we asked executives and employees about whether they feel their workplace, that workplace they operate in enables thriving of employees with disabilities in terms of having the right technology and environment and support. And this is an important finding because compared to the global result of 67% of executives saying, yes, this is what we do, in our countries, right, Brazil, Argentina, and Spain, the result is nearly 80%. 80% of executives saying, yes, we do that. We provide the right technology environment and support. But that drops to just 42% of, exec of employees who agree. That's an even more significant gap than we saw in the global results. One which executives must have top of mind for when they're failing to, or, or they're for, for when they're falling short, right, on providing the necessary adjustments, the accommodations, or when the technology platforms or tools are not compliant with accessibility guidelines, or when accessibility features are added too late in the design, the development process, businesses find themselves exposed to legal, financial, reputational risk, but also poor employee engagement. 
However, by providing increased access to technologies that meet the needs of persons with disabilities, the organizations can lay that foundation for inclusive work cultures that enable all employees to thrive, presenting a tremendous opportunity. After all, what may be necessary for some is ultimately beneficial for all. Next slide. And perhaps even more worrisome is what we saw when we asked the employees across a number of dimensions, how committed they feel their employer is to helping them to advance, to thrive within the workplace. Ultimately, it's just 24%, one in five employees with disabilities across Brazil, Argentina, and Spain, who feel that their employer is fully committed to helping them to thrive and succeed. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Next slide. So that's the context for what our survey tells us about the situation in the workplace, what executives perceive, what employees experience. But of course, right, we wanted to take it further. We wanted to unearth the lessons to be learned from those environments in which employees with disabilities are thriving. So again, we focused on the responses from our employees with disabilities to assess levels of what we call human potential, what's commonly known as engagement in the workplace. And when we talk about human potential, what we really mean in this study is around two things. One is around career, the satisfaction, what what they aspire to do going forward. Do you aspire for senior leadership? That sort of thing. And the second is around the sense of confidence and belonging, the ability to give of your best to the organization. Are you comfortable raising issues, asking questions, being open about who you are and what you want to do? Do you have the freedom to innovate, to fail? These sorts of things. And in those, in those descriptors, by the way, you may be um, correlating that to the topic of psychological safety, right? That's ultimately when you talk about confidence, belonging, these sorts of things. And we took that sense of employee potential or engagement and set that against 200 workplace culture factors mapping one against the other. And the idea of this is to say, which factors or characteristics of the workplace and that culture have a significant and positive effect on employee potential. And what this allowed us to do is identify those factors which positively and significantly influence thriving among employees with disabilities. Now, once we had those in place, we were able to also identify workplaces at the very top, our top 10%, where these factors are most common. And we refer to those as the more equal cultures. Next slide. So in addition to the fundamental role that we know accessibility and accommodations, right, uh, plays in fostering an inclusive culture, there are eight less obvious factors which our model shows have a positive and significant impact on the likelihood of an employee with a disability to thrive in the workplace. And I heard Susan touching upon some of these earlier, and you'll see some of them listed even on this slide. And remember by thriving, we, we mean career satisfaction, aspirations, and that sense of confidence and belonging, psychological safety. They are role models. So they, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you what those eight factors were that bubble to the top, and that's role models, flexible working policies, employee resource groups, fair pay, parental leave policies, the freedom to innovate in accessible, appropriate workspaces, mental well-being policies and programs, and accessible, relevant training that is designed to advance awareness of inclusion and diversity topics right along with supporting the continuous development and thriving of employees with disabilities. Now, Specifically on the confidence and belonging side, where psychological safety is paramount 
to the person with disability who has especially not yet disclosed, those of us who, who are keeping our disabilities hidden. There are five factors that play a critical role there and they're shaded here in gray. And let's discuss two of these in particular. The first is mental well-being policies. Our analysis of this factor indicates that having formal mental wellness policies and programs increases the likelihood that an employee will disclose a disability by 38% compared to employees of, um, of companies that don't. So, and this is, by the way, this is when that employee is ready to disclose, right? So at Accenture, we have a mental health ally program, for example, through which um, more than 5,000 employees in 24 uh, countries are volunteers trained to listen when a peer needs support, provide a safe, non-judgmental space and help colleagues access the resources as needed. There's a lot of stress and anxiety involved when one is keeping a disability hidden, especially when, as I mentioned earlier, through those interviews, we found they're doing so out of fear of retribution, slower progression, or even losing their job. The second factor I wanted to dig in is around bold role models, which also relates to mentorship. And I'll, I'll never forget the first connection I had with Chad Jardee, at the time he was our chief compliance officer, global lead for responsible business. He's now retired and the current chairperson for um, the, the disability in organization. But it was, it was just prior to my coming out right more fully uh, in 2017, when I was in the early stages of exploring the ideas of a business case for disability diversion and inclusion in the workplace. And, we were meeting via conference calls, so there was no way of me knowing that he was an amputee due to being hit by a drunk driver. He shared this openly as we got deeper into the conversation, and I learned shortly after that Chad was also our global executive sponsor for disability inclusion initiatives, including many of the studies I had worked on prior to his retirement, which was, again, earlier this year. So yes, I suppose I'm, a, I'm among those who are 26% more likely to be open about our disabilities when we have visible role models in leadership. And since I went public with my disability, growing number of people at my company and beyond have told me that my disclosure has helped them feel more included, more willing to ask for what they need to thrive, more confident in their futures. In fact, the study illustrates that having role models who are open about their disabilities, these, these employees are 15% more likely to have higher career aspirations than their peers and organizations where this is not the case. And to be honest, knowing now how my experience has helped others, I often wish I had opened up sooner. And just before we move on, the three other um, factors include ERGs, very important, freedom to innovate. This is all around that freedom to ask questions, be creative, fail, right? Um, and relevant and accessible training. Now, again, there's no, or maybe I haven't mentioned, but there's no sense of causality here that putting these factors in place will absolutely lead to more employees thriving. But what our model shows, again, is that likelihood of these factors being present in an organization where individuals are thriving. Next slide. I'll roll you through these pretty quickly so we can get to some Q&A. The final piece was clearly around, right, what, what is, what, what's in this for the business, right, and what do employees with disabilities stand to gain? Um, so in terms of the employees, there are major differences to employee engagement. If we compare the best workplaces of that top 10% versus the worst workplaces, the bottom 10% where those factors are most common. And there are big increases in engagement levels, 50% higher in the most disability inclusive workplaces compared to top workplace comparing, right? Top to the bottom. And similar gains in areas such as uh, stronger career satisfaction and aspirations and a higher sense of confidence and belonging. 
and I should say this is analysis we did specifically for our sample, Brazil, Argentina, and Spain. Next slide. And in terms of the commercial benefits, the business case, as it were, we know that there are a range of studies that have shown that teams are more productive, more innovative, right? When employees are engaged, and we list these in, in the actual report, Enabling Change. Our survey analysis goes further though, to show that companies led by executives who are focused on disability engagement, again, among that top 10%, are growing sales nearly three times and profits four times faster than their peers. And I will, I'll end there and, and maybe turn it over for some, um, for some questions. What an interesting presentation, Laurie. Thank you for sharing it at our conference. Laurie, let us ask you a personal question. If a study like Enabling Change had been published earlier, how do you think it might have impacted your personal life and your professional development as a person with a disability? Do you think it would have allowed you to make the disability known to your employee earlier? Yeah, so first, um, I do want to acknowledge again, right, that disclosing a disability is a very personal choice and journey. So many of us are uh, raised with stigma, right? There's so much stigma around this. Um, but. What this study does is it illustrates for both employees and organizations alike, right? It illustrates what those factors are that would influence that positive culture of openness and engagement among especially the employees who are hiding, right, a disability. So I was employed at Accenture for almost five years when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed in 2004, two years after my son was born. And I was trying to understand what this disease even was at the time, let alone the long-term impacts it might bring and how I might even talk about it with others. So for a long time, almost 10 years, in fact, it was just my immediate family and my immediate supervisors who were aware. And when I experienced that, that you know, another flare up in 2014 or attack as sometimes we call them, at a time of extreme personal and professional stress, I had to take a lengthy amount of time off. And it was that experience that led me to expand what I called, I called them my trusted tribe, right? This included members of my team at work, my HR lead, even more friends and family who had not known prior to that. And this process of sharing gradual building that confidence right allowed me to to do that to build to build that confidence but here's the thing it also coincided with Accenture's increasing efforts and focus to help all employees build a sense of confidence belonging and inclusion regardless of disability race gender you know uh, LGBT plus you know etc I was hearing more about our persons with disabilities, uh, champions program, our disability ERG initiatives, and that steady drumbeat of being truly human and bringing your whole self to work, that was there. I started to engage more, share more. I felt anxieties lessen while confidence and sense of belonging increased. So I guess you could say that while Accenture has been on its journey of inclusion, so was I. And 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 it was a steady it was a steadily empowering experience to when i chose to fully disclose in the fall of of 2017 gracias lori en la misma línea base thank you lori Along the same lines, based on your personal experience, what recommendations would you give to those people who are listening to us and are 
not really sure about disclosing their disability at work, what recommendations would you give to their employers to generate trusting and safe spaces at work? Yeah. So I would say, look for opportunities to talk, to learn of the live, you know, connect, to learn of the lived experiences of others with disabilities to share your own story, right? That is very much a part of, of the disability disclosure journey. This this sharing of our stories while bringing our whole selves to work, which will bolster the experiences, innovation, and even mental wellness. So for me, that meant, again, a very gradual journey spread across a number of years as I steadily built my confidence. I learned more about my disease, how it would affect me, my role at times, and steadily learned that others benefited from my sharing as well. And employers, remember this discussion and the factors we discuss because they lay the foundation. Look for ways to proactively and purposefully embed these factors, these signals into your organization. Because, you know, what I, what I always say is, we don't know what we don't know. And the needs of those of us with invisible disabilities will remain your organization's blind spot until you open that door of psychological safety that will invite us to walk through and to start sharing openly, to ask for help, to release, well, oh, I'm getting emotional, um, to release the fears and the anxieties that I know I felt and that, you know, result from keeping a disability hidden. Sin duda, Lori, eh, mencionas muchas iniciativas. Thank you very eh, much, Lori. Without a doubt, there are many initiatives that we have to incorporate in our companies. Um, finally, we would like to elaborate, we would like you to elaborate on the change of the perception of employees and employers about the potential on, of inclusion. What recommendations would you give to business leaders to understand the value of people with disabilities as potential collaborators, clients, users, and so forth. What recommendations would you give to organizations of people with disabilities to continue to inspire your change? Yeah. Wow. Um, it's a loaded question, <laughs> but I know we can all agree that creating a diverse and inclusive workplace is the right thing to do, right? I mean, um, and we have seen that there are several studies, reports, stories on what a culture of inclusion can bring to organizations, large and small, including increased innovation, productivity, empathy, uh, enhanced employee and customer experience. But the value has also been proven when you consider that study I mentioned earlier, the disability inclusion advantage. In fact, you know, that study, which was a collaborative effort alongside Disability Inn and the American Association of Persons with Disabilities, right? We found that those organizations who were more advanced in employing, engaging, enabling, and empowering, by four E's, right? <laughs> Persons with disabilities, were seeing 28% higher net revenue, two times higher net income, and 30% higher economic profit margin than their peers. So there's a business case there. And in terms of inspiring change, remember, it's a journey. It's n there's no one size fits all. No one has this perfect. I also challenge anyone who says there are best practices because in my view, they're all lessons learned. But what I've experienced is that you need to bring your people along this journey with you, engage your ERGs, your employees with disabilities, external organizations and partners into the planning, the ideation, the decisions that are being made. Be prepared to make bold decisions and to engage your leadership in those decisions. And again, where you have difficulty, go out to the ecosystem, reach out to other organizations, nonprofits, et cetera, for discussion, 
hear those lessons learned. Get some great examples that will inspire you and some really helpful guidance. Gracias, Lori, una vez más por ser parte de nuestra conferencia. Thank you, Lori, once again for being part of our Zero Project Conference uh, for Latin America, the Spanish-speaking world. We wish you success in all your future undertakings and an excellent day. Thank you so much, everyone. Los Los invitamos entonces a continuar asistiendo. So we invite you to continue attending the sessions scheduled for today in on both channels which you can schedule from our platform at 1345 local time we will back on both channels simultaneously for a keynote session a global look awareness and legislation moving from discourse to action we will have two speakers who will talk about how to generate impact in decision making spaces we will be joined by former U.S. Senator Thomas Harking and Kate Nash, founder and CEO of Purple Space. This was a very interesting session indeed, and after it, it is the specific programming, programming of each channel. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us through the help menu. Remember that if there are two sessions, that interest you at the same time after the transmission of each one, they will be available available for you to rewatch them. We thank you for your company and hope you enjoy the following sessions. Thank you very much. Have a good day.